Hello, thank you for joining us today. We will be talking about navigating health insurance and medication access for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. My name is Amy Lestrange. I'm a nurse practitioner in the Division of Gastroenterology at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. And this topic is significant to me since I work closely with our IBD patients advocating for access to needed treatment. My disclosures include being a speaker and consultant for Abby and Janssen. This is an outline on what we'll be covering. We'll provide a background on different types of health insurance plans, what's covered and what to consider when selecting a plan. Some of the access issues and challenges that patients with IBD face with their medication coverage, provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to appeal a denied claim, and recap some of the resources available to you to help navigate all that we discussed today. As we know, IBD is a chronic illness that requires continuous monitoring, testing, and treatments. So choosing a health insurance plan in the hopes to cover all of these anticipated costs can be an overwhelming task. We'll briefly go over some of the terms you'll hear when discussing health insurance. Understanding these terms will help you and your family when it's time to select a health insurance plan. Health insurance premiums the monthly or yearly bill you pay to access a health insurance plan. Copay, the fixed amount you pay for a specific service or provider visit. For example, a copay for a primary care visit could be $25 a visit, but a copay for a specialist like GI could be $45 a visit. Deductible, this is the specific dollar amount before health insurance may require you to pay an out-of-pocket towards medical care each year before your health plan begins to pay for the covered medical expenses. However, deductibles don't apply to all services. Most plans will cover routine doctor's visits, prescription drugs, and preventative care before you've met your deductible. For example, with a $3,000 deductible, you pay the first $3,000 of covered services yourself. After that, your health insurance will kick in and cover the bills. Oftentimes, plans with lower monthly premiums have higher deductibles. Out-of-pocket maximum. This is the most you'll ever have to pay for covered health services in a given year. After you reach this maximum, the plan covers 100% of the cost. Generally, this includes the deductible, co-insurance, and co-payments, however, not premiums. Plans can set different out-of-pocket limits for different services, and some plans don't have out-of-pocket limits. When choosing a plan, this is an important feature to look at. As with IBD, medical expenses can add up very quickly. Plans with lower individual out-of-pocket limits may be an attractive feature to consider. Coinsurance. The percentage of medical expenses that you pay after you meet the deductible or until you reach your out-of-pocket maximum. So for example, let's say you have a surgery to repair a fistula and the estimated cost of the procedure is $12,000. So you have a deductible of $3,000 coinsurance 20%, out-of-pocket maximum $6,850. You pay all of the first $3,000, your deductible. You'll pay 20% of the remaining $9,000 or $1,800, your coinsurance. So your total out-of-pocket cost would be $4,800. Your $3,000 deductible plus your $1,800 coinsurance. Now let's go through the private and public health insurance options. Employer health insurance is known as group coverage when the employer researches available plans and then selects the insurance company and picks the plan options for employees. Coverage is dependent on the individual's or family member's employment. Individual plans are plans that are purchased by the individual to cover themselves and or their family. These can be purchased online through a broker, but now there's an option of purchasing through the health insurance marketplace. This is the newest way to find quality healthcare coverage in one place. Depending on income and family size, you may have the opportunity to save money by qualifying for lower out-of-pocket costs, for co-pays and deductibles, and lower costs on monthly premiums. It's important to note that with the marketplace, you must enroll during a specific enrollment period. Now let's go through the different private health insurance plans. HMO or Health Maintenance Organization, with an HMO, you pay a set premium. In return, HMOs offer a range of health benefits, including preventative care. They have an assigned primary care physician, so HMOs are required to use their doctors and require referrals for specialty. 
PPO, Participating Provider Option. This is a more flexible plan than HMO. You have the option of receiving care from doctors, hospitals, and specialists in the network or outside of the network. And you don't always need a referral to see a specialist. However, premiums are higher and usually you have an annual deductible. Point of service plan, this is a managed care plan that combines the features of HMO and PPO. Like managed care plans, you will have to choose a primary care provider from the healthcare network, and then that primary care provider becomes your point of service. Fee for service or indemnity plan, these plans are set up to reimburse medical providers for each service you receive on a case-by-case -case basis. It can be very expensive with high premiums and deductibles. High deductible plans, this plan has a higher deductible than traditional insurance plans, but generally has a lower monthly premium. Patients may pay more healthcare costs out of pocket before the insurance company starts to pay. A healthcare savings account or HSA is available under this plan to help pay for your care. The money you put into a health savings account is not taxed. It can be used on certain medical expenses. But in order to have a health care savings account, you must be enrolled in a high deductible health plan. Now we'll review the public health insurance options, including Medicaid for low income and Medicare for seniors ages 65 and over and for those receiving Social Security disability payments. Medicaid is a state administered health insurance program for low income families, children, pregnant women, the elderly, those with disabilities, and in some states, other adults. The federal government provides a portion of the funding and sets guidelines. States also have choices in how they design their programs. So Medicaid programs and eligibility vary from state to state and may have a different name in your state. Medicare is insurance for seniors ages 65 and over. There are four parts to Medicare that cover different healthcare services. Part A, hospital care, is fully covered by taxes. Part B, physician visits, is covered by taxes. However, monthly premium and Part C and D are paid for by the program participant. There is still a monthly premium that the program participant has to pay for Part B. Only Part A is fully covered under taxes. So in more detail, Medicare Part A, this is the hospital insurance that helps cover inpatient care in hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, hospice, and home care. Most beneficiaries are enrolled in Part A automatically. Medicare Part B is the medical coverage that helps to cover medically necessary services like doctor's visits, outpatient care, home health services, and other medical services. Part B also covers some preventative services. Medicare Part C, or Medicare Advantage, this is the type of Medicare health plan offered by private companies approved by Medicare to provide you with your Medicare Part A and B benefits. There are many types of Medicare Advantage plans, including HMOs, PPOs, private fee-for-service plans, special needs plans, and Medicare medical savings account plans. If you're enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, Medicare services are covered through the plan and aren't paid for under Parts A and B. And most Medicare Advantage plans offer prescription drug coverage. This is different than a Medicare Supplement Insurance or Medigap policy, which we'll discuss in just a minute. Medicare Part D is an optional program that provides prescription drug coverage and only applies to those who do not have Medicare Extra Help. So there are two ways to get Medicare prescription drug coverage, either through a Medicare prescription drug plan or a Medicare Advantage plan that includes drug coverage. These plans are offered by insurance companies and other private companies approved by Medicare. Oftentimes, patients on Medicare fall into something called the donut hole. The Medicare donut hole was designed to promote the use of lower cost generic medications over higher cost brand name medications. So participants would have a financial incentive to seek the lower cost prescription medications to avoid going beyond a certain amount which in 2018 is $3,750 in total drug costs and entering the donut hole where they would have to pay more. There are three states of coverage. You pay 100% of the drug cost until you hit your deductible, and the deductible can range and be up to $400. Initial coverage, once you hit the deductible, you're responsible for prescription co-pays until you reach a certain limit. 
in 2018. Again, this is $3,750. Coverage gap with the donut hole, if you go over the limit, which like we said in 2018 is $3,750, you enter the donut hole. So for a period of time, you pay a higher cost for prescription medication. The donut hole ends when you reach a certain out-of-pocket maximum. In 2018, this is $5,000. Catastrophic coverage period. Then you enter the period where you're only responsible for 5% of the cost. It's important to note that not everyone enters the donut hole, and some Medicare plans have coverage to protect you from the donut hole. Now we cover Medicare Supplemental Insurance, or what's called Medigap. This is a private insurance that supplements original Medicare and covers gaps in Medicare coverage. This would cover co-payments, deductibles, co-insurance, not covered by the original Medicare. If you have original Medicare and Medigap policy, Medicare will pay its share of the Medicare approved amounts for covered healthcare costs. A Medigap policy is different from a Medicare Advantage plan like an HMO or PPO because those plans are ways to get Medicare benefits while Medigap policy only supplements the cost of your original Medicare benefits. New Medigap policies don't offer prescription drug coverage. If you want prescription drug coverage, you must get a standalone Medicare prescription drug plan that works with the original Medicare. Now let's touch on drug coverage. Health insurance plans have a formulary, a list of drugs that they cover. Oftentimes the drugs in the formula are arranged into tiers with different levels of cost sharing and co-assurance assigned to particular medications. Lower tier drugs cost less than higher tier drugs. This is an example of a tier with United Healthcare. It's important to note that other insurance companies have other types of tiers. Next, we'll touch on medical benefits versus pharmacy benefits. Medical benefits includes drugs that are injected or infused in the office, such as an outpatient clinic or infusion center by a healthcare professional. Pharmacy benefits includes drugs that are self-administered, including those that are oral, self-injectable, or offer a route of administration that the patient can do at home. Authorization for specific drugs may go through different channels, depending on whether they're covered by medical or pharmacy benefits. Sometimes, Medications can be denied under the pharmacy benefits, but approved under a medical benefit. For example, all use of injections may be denied under home injection under the pharmacy benefit, but approved under the medical benefit if the patient goes into the infusion center or physician's office to receive the injection. The cost of the infusion medication includes the cost of the drug and the facility's fees to infuse the drug. Infusion centers often require that the drug be supplied by the pharmacy associated with the infusion center. This is known as to buy and bill. The pharmacy may charge more for the drug than the specialty pharmacy associated with the insurance company. Different infusion centers charge different facility fees to infuse the drug. The hospital setting is usually more expensive than the outpatient facility setting. Together, these can cause significant differences in cost, depending on where you're getting it. Because of these differences in drug facility fee costs, insurance companies often require that a patient get an infusion at a preferred or cheaper location or use home infusion company. Home infusions are becoming more common since the insurance company can ship the drug from their specialty pharmacy. It's important to note the difference between the two and what your coverage is in case you need to make adjustments to eliminate these high out-of-pocket costs. The cost of managing IBD keeps rising, as do the number of barriers faced by IBD patients and their families. I now want to briefly touch on a few common access issues facing our community today. So what do I do if the drug my provider recommends is not on formulary? The first step is to work with your provider to submit an exception based on medical necessity. Another option is that you ask your provider to recommend a different drug, or you can pay for the drug out of pocket if you're able to. If your provider requests an exception and it's denied, you can further appeal by writing to your insurance company, and we'll go through that later in more detail. So now, what if the medication is on my formulary, however, the pharmacy will not fill it? You need to get a prior authorization. Your provider needs to get an approval from your health insurance for the drug, even if it is on your formulary. If a prior authorization is denied, your pharmacy will not be able to fill the prescription. Be careful about getting medication from non-U.S.-based pharmacies because they're less expensive. 
kinship provider will not be able to guarantee they're the same. Let's move on to tests and procedures. If the colonoscopy is denied, the provider will have to appeal this decision to try to get it covered before proceeding with the procedure or choose a different test that can be approved or you can pay out of pocket for the procedure. In terms of lab test denial, if this happens, the provider can appeal for coverage of the lab and explain the rationale for why it was needed. However, at the end of the day, sometimes patients do get stuck with the lab bill. This can happen with things like fecal calprotectin, which some insurance companies consider an investigational test and therefore do not cover, despite the fact that it's not investigational at all and its use in IBD has been well established. Now we'll talk about step therapy or fail first. This is when your insurance company requires that you take a less costly drug instead of the one prescribed by your provider. For example, your insurance company mandates that you have to try and fail drug A and B before they will cover drug C. During this delay in optimal treatment, you may suffer from worsening healthcare outcomes, such as disease progression, complication, hospitalization, and even surgery, with a decreased quality of life. Despite the fact that drug C may be better as an initial therapy, it is often unlikely that a provider can successfully appeal this without the patient having to fail the required drugs A and B first. Exceptions to this do exist, particularly when it comes to un the unique side effects of the therapy. For example, a patient has a history of melanoma or heart failure, which can be worsened by anti-TNF therapy, and therefore drugs like Lisa can not be chosen as an initial therapy, despite the fact that Rupinol preferred first-line agent on formulary. This type of an appeal has a much better chance of being approved as opposed to a patient who likes to do injections instead of infusions. Let's go into copay accumulators. Many patients need some form of copay assistance to offset these high costs that come with living with IBD. This copay assistance often comes in the form of qualifying award granted from the manufacturer of the medicine. This award helps offset the patient's out-of-pocket costs for high deductibles and copays. Patients apply for copay assistance if they qualify, which most patients do that have commercial insurance. The drug manufacturer provides the patient with a fixed amount of assistance for the year. In the end, this helps the patients afford the drug and adhere to the medication. These accumulator programs target specialty drugs for which a manufacturer provides copay assistance. For the copay accumulator, the manufacturer payments do not count towards the patient's deductible or out-of-pocket maximum obligations. The manufacturer funds prescriptions until the maximum value of the copay program is reached. After that point, the patient's out-of-pocket payments begin counting towards their annual deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. So this is having a negative impact on patients right now. Here's a good illustration of how a copay accumulator program works. Data has to take a medication that costs $200. With the drug manufacturer copay card, he only pays $25 out of pocket for the drug, while the drug man manufacturer would pay the remaining $175. If Jada has a copay accumulator program, then only the $25 would be applied to Jada's deductible, where if she did not have a copay accumulator program, the entire $200 would have been applied to her deductible. Eventually, the drug manufacturer assistance program will run out and Jada will need to pay more out-of-pocket expenses as her deductible will not be met. The impact on patients is significant as accumulator adjustments could potentially lead to patients experiencing this copay surprise and higher out-of-pocket costs annually. There's a real risk that patients may not stay on their treatment or seek to switch to a different treatment for non-medical reasons as a result. And data shows that stopping treatment leads to poor health outcomes and potentially higher costs of healthcare systems. People most likely to be enrolled in these copay accumulator programs are those in high deductible healthcare plans. So if you've been affected by this type of policy and had to switch to another drug, tell your insurer and tell your employer. They may have adopted this program thinking that it's a cost-saving strategy without truly understanding the negative impacts that it could have on their employees. Access issues can lead to huge out-of-pocket expenses, switching to less effective treatment, stopping treatment altogether, and ultimately causing higher costs to our healthcare system. 
So this is an example of a patient's story dealing with a delay in access to our treatment. This is a 22-year-old female with Crohn's disease, currently in clinical and endoscopic remission. She recently started a new job and new health insurance. When refilling her maintenance drug, this was not on her insurance plan for drug formulary. However, it was in the formulary for ulcerative colitis, not Crohn's. She was denied coverage. The providers did not want her to switch biologic drug and had to fax an urgent ex expedited appeal letter to explain why it was so important to keep her on the medication. And this delay led to an anxiety and flare of symptoms. In the meantime, the patient reached out to the manufacturer for help. They did send over a one month supply of the medication until the appeal was reviewed and eventually approved. When your claim is denied, here are the steps to appeal the claim. Get a copy of your plan and document summary. Review the denial letter for instructions on how to appeal and ensure your provider has a copy. Write a letter to appeal the denied claim. And the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation has templates available. Ask your provider to write a letter of medical necessity and ask your provider to call your health insurance company. The helpful tips on a filing and appeal, file it quickly and pay attention to the dates. There can be a time limit on how appeals may be requested after a claim is denied. Keep all copies of correspondence from the healthcare team and the insurance company. Keep a record of all the names and titles of everyone you speak to and any case or authorization numbers. Go online to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website for templates to various appeal letters ranging from medications, tests, treatments, disability, and school work accommodations. So here are three things you can do if your claim is still denied after you appeal. You can talk to your HR department, reach out to your state's consumer assistance program or Department of Insurance, or reach out to the Jennifer Jaff Care Line for additional case management support and patient advocacy services. Don't be afraid to speak to your provider about the challenges you may be facing and getting access to your treatment. They can connect you with social workers, case managers, billing experts, and other nonprofits. And drug manufacturers may also be able to help as well. You can also contact the IBD Help Center or go online to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website. Thank you again for joining us today.